So just to make sh sure that everybody knows they're in the right session, um, this is the uh, Pluto and Sharon in the rear view, MU69 dead ahead, uh, off the starboard bow, otherwise known as P13F. So just to make sure you're all in the right room. And um, Kelsey Singer and I, Fran Bagnall, are going to be um, chairing this session. And um, we are going to start now. It's just turned 1.40. Uh, we have eight, eight talks. The first two are invited. They will be 17 minutes long, and you will get a, a beeping light. We'll, green will go to, to yellow at five. Uh, five minutes. And then we have 12 minute talks. So the first talk is Alan Stern will be um, talking about New Horizons, the exploration of Pluto system and the Kuiper Belt. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the, the session organizers for putting this together. I'm sorry? If you need a, a pointer. laser, there's for that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So. Uh, you know, it's been said that New Horizons is a, is a mission of, of delayed gratification, that it took 14 years to get funded and nine and a half years to cross the solar system. Not so this talk, which I understood was a 20-minute talk until I was told 10 minutes ago that it's a 17-minute talk, minus three minutes for questions, so it's really a 14-minute talk. So we're going to proceed quickly. How do I advance the slides? Uh, use the arrows. Use these arrows. These arrows? Yep. Which one? The down arrow? Yeah. The cross arrow? The up arrow? None of these arrows work. Okay. Stop the clock. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that arrow? You want to try yeah. that? Oh. There we go. Oh. Good. I see. Okay. It's, a, it's a Mac Sorry. keyboard for a Mac presentation. Yeah. Great. Okay. Very briefly, a little bit of background. New Horizons, first mission in the SMD planetary division. New Frontiers program was launched in January of 2006 and flew across the solar system via a Jupiter gravity assist to reach the Pluto system in the summer of 2015. Uh, since then, uh, we have been uh, flying out into the Kuiper belt. In this presentation, I will tell you a little bit about the spacecraft and its capabilities, but I'm going to concentrate primarily on two things, and that are uh, an overview, a broad overview of results from the Pluto system and then uh, some preview material on uh, the extended mission that we're now flying through the year 2021. Uh, the New Horizons spacecraft is a flyby spacecraft, nuclear-powered X-band communication, large solid-state recorders, and seven scientific instruments, three in-situ instruments, a uh, dust mass spectrometer, uh, and two plasma spectrometers swap at kilovolt energies for the solar wind and Pepsi for MEV energies. Uh, energetic charge particles. And then uh, four remote sensing instruments uh, that include both uh, medium and long focal length panchromatic cameras, color cameras, infrared mapping spectroscopy, ultraviolet mapping spectroscopy, and radio science for doing thermal brightness measurements, uh, radar reflectivity, and its primary experiment, which is a uh, ground-based uplink uh, to measure the temperature and pressure profile in Pluto's atmosphere. And all of those instruments um, are working perfectly uh, now uh, 12 years after launch. Okay. Uh, we knew at the time that this mission was being architected that the pluto sharon binary uh, was uh, going to be a spectacular system, and it did not let us down. The binary, of course, we did not know at the time that we were designing the mission is actually surrounded by a system of four small satellites, in addition uh, to the primary, Pluto, and the secondary, Charon, that you see there in the background. Um, I want to point out, because there are so many here in the audience that have an interest, that all of the data from the flyby was on the ground more than a year ago, and all of that data is now in the PDS, and almost all of it is available to you, except for some details from our, our final data delivery Everything is now available, and you can access those data freely. I think that those details will get cleaned up. They mostly have to do with uh, one instrument data set and some of our metadata sets. Uh, and of course, there's a New Frontiers uh, data analysis program you can propose to uh, for funding uh, to help us understand the Pluto system. Um, this session 
uh, consists of uh, my talk and then an invited talk by Leslie Young, who's going to cover some aspects of the Pluto system that um, uh, are outside the purview of my talk. She'll talk primarily about the atmosphere and surface composition in the system. And then there are four contributed talks, uh, all on very interesting topics. You can see them there um, about Pluto system results. And I want to also mention that there's a very nice suite of posters downstairs that I spent a couple of hours going through this morning, and I encourage you to do that. Later in this session, towards the end, we have three talks regarding our extended mission, both results and plans, uh, which I know you'll find very interesting. Uh, and so stay tuned for that. Uh, don't leave early. Uh, I think you'll, uh, you'll find some very interesting news in what's being reported scientifically there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what we learned in the Pluto system. I'll start with the small satellites, which you see there left to right in order of their Pluto-centric distance, Styx, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra with a scale bar. Uh, and then in the lower right, uh, a nice animated GIF that will play for another 10 or 20 seconds, showing the, um, the rapid rotation relative to their Kepler periods. But there were other surprises as well, um, puzzlingly high albedos as high as the brightest surfaces on Pluto on these small satellites, unlike uh, any small Kuiper belt object that's ever been observed of similar size. Um, the discovery of crystalline water ice on their surfaces, crystalline, not amorphous water ice. Um, the fact that their surfaces are old, three to four billion years old from crater counting. Uh, as I said, they're rapid rotators. That was surprising. And in addition, um, uh, relative to the obliquities of Pluto and Charon that are co-aligned and uh, in, in the system, if they're pointing up, the four small satellites are all roughly approximately normal to the pole vectors of the primary and the secondary, and that's that's uh, also, was also a surprise. Um, regarding uh, the secondary, Charon, which looks a lot like a run-of-the-mill icy satellite to first order, uh, could be orbiting Saturn or Uranus or Neptune or Jupiter, uh, about 1,200 kilometers in diameter. Um, I think the big ticket discoveries that, um, that we like to point out in review talks like this are the red uh, Tholen composition polar cap, which we believe was created by the accretion of escaping methane from Pluto's atmosphere that was later photolyzed in the UV radiation field to create that, uh, that polar stain. Uh, the fact that um, all of the units on the um, high resolution encounter hemisphere that you see here um, are, um, are uniformly old and that Sharon's geologic engine more or less ran out very early after its formation. Uh, there is a large extensional tectonic belt, which I will point out here, running across the equator, which we believe is formed uh, due to the stresses of uh, the water ice inside of Sharon. Uh, cooling early in its history, and a, uh, a rock to ice ratio of about 0.6, about 10% less than Pluto, and consistent with um, a giant impact after a uh, differentiation on Pluto. Other highlights from the, uh, the flyby for Sharon included uh, uh, very strong limits on any atmosphere um, down at the million times lower than the detected atmosphere on Pluto. The discovery of, me uh, excuse me, discovery of ammonia or, or, or ammonia hydrate outcrops in uh, primarily in ejecta blankets in craters on the surface. And we don't know whether that's excavated material from the interior, the ammonia, or whether it's from some of the impactors themselves and imported. And the interesting discovery of this um, pitted or textured terrains that, um, that could be seen near the Terminator where the uh, lighting is favorable, and we were just this past week, in fact, talking about uh, possible formation mechanisms for terrains like this. So now let's turn to the star of the show, to Pluto, uh, which you see here in all of its glory and approximately true color, um, really a scientific wonderland. I will point out, and you can see it in the upper right, that as we were on approach, we imaged all longitudes of Pluto at increasingly better resolution, but of course the close flyby and all the high resolution imaging um, took place on one hemisphere because Pluto's a slow rotator with a 6.4 day rotation period. Uh, the image that you see here is about 900 meters per pixel, 
By contrast, the very best high resolution imaging is about 70 to 80 meters per pixel on selected um, strips across the planet. Among the really amazing attributes that we see on Pluto's surface are a wide range of uh, surface ages, as indicated by the little inset on the upper left where the yellow dots are identified craters that have a very non-uniform distribution across the surface. Um, the vast um, ice field of uh, nitrogen called Sputnik Planitia, which itself uh, is uh, dynamically alive. And we see both horizontal transport and evidence for convective vertical transport uh, uh, on its surface. Um, something you'll hear more about from Kelsey Singer a little bit later, the third inset as we move from left to right, which is evidence for uh, large and apparently young cryovolcanoes on Pluto's surface. And um, also evidence that we won't have time to talk about in this session very much, maybe Leslie will speak to that, uh, which is evidence for the possible past presence of liquids uh, flowing or ponding or perhaps slurries on Pluto's surface like that apparent frozen lake. I won't speak to the atmosphere at all, though you can see it in the, the, the panchromatic um, black and white image here. Leslie will speak to that extensively, including the haze layers. Some of the key findings that I want to point out for Pluto are the extreme geological and atmospheric complexity, um, which really uh, uh, rivals that of much larger planets like Mars. The significant degree of continuing and ongoing um, long-term geologic and climatic activity. Um, Sputnik itself, which is just an unparalleled feature um, in our solar system. Um, Extensive glaciation, and as I said, with both horizontal and vertical transport taking place even today. Um, extensive well-organized atmospheric hazes, a dramatically reduced atmospheric escape rate relative to predictions, uh, reduced by three orders of magnitude, uh, and evidence for dramatic changes in the long-term atmospheric pressure over cycles of millions of years. Some questions that, um, this is my own personal list, but some things to think about um, in the Pluto system you know, with volatile transport being so active, why are there such strong gradients in albedo and color and composition across the surface? I'm sure that Leslie will have something to say about that. Um, what is the source of the energy source of Pluto's ongoing geological activity that allows it to be so active four billion years after its formation? How can we explain a large and young cryovolcano like Wright Mons, which you'll again hear about a little bit later, What's the source of the methane on Sharon? And by the way, it was also found on the, the smaller satellite Nix. Uh, methane, I meant to say ammonia. And how do Pluto's small satellites remain so highly reflective? I, that's a puzzle to me that, um, in fact, we were just debating on email yesterday. And why didn't we find any more rings or satellites? I was particularly surprised uh, that we didn't find more satellites in the system because our upper limits on, on satellite sizes, order of magnitude smaller than the ones detected from the Earth. Um, but that's the fact. I have to say, we saw all these longitudes of Pluto, some of them very well uh, on the encounter hemisphere, and others not as well. And now that we have all this data, we're in this very difficult and frustrating position that reminds me of where we were in the 90s after the mutual event seasons and the first Hubble images that showed us very crude albedo features on Pluto's surface and some of the other great discoveries in the 80s and the 90s where we were kind of stuck until we got a mission to go out and do a flyby. And now we are once again stuck because we wish we had a second flyby that had shown us the other face of Pluto, which is clearly very different than the encounter hemisphere. We wish that we could get time domain because so many of the processes that are um, evident on the surface require time domain studies to understand. And we wish that we could have other types of instrumentation like uh, ice penetrating radars, mass spectrometers for the atmosphere, uh, gravity studies to show us where the mass concentrations are and to guide us to whether there truly is an ocean beneath Pluto's surface, and thermal mappers and other kinds of instruments as well. But none of those are going to happen unless we have a return mission. At the same time, the Kuiper Belt population of dwarf planets is extremely variegated. They, they are... Um, uh, at least as variegated as the terrestrial planets. And there are more of them, and they have different complexities on their surface in terms of composition, and different colors, and different 
complements of satellites and even different shapes. Some of the largest, like Haumea, are not in hydrostatic equilibrium. And to boot, we're finding ring systems like at Haumea. I think this population also calls for continued exploration. In the meantime, though, New Horizons is off on a mission to explore the Kuiper Belt for the next five years. We wrote an extend, extended mission proposal to senior review. It was highly ranked, as you see there, the green arrow um, on the upper right. Um, and then uh, we received a letter from the science mission directorate approving us for a five-year mission for a multi-pronged study of the Kuiper Belt. We have fuel and power to fly more extended missions, but let me just tell you about this one. Um, it has three primary components. The, the one that's probably best known is the close flyby of a small Kuiper Belt object called 2014 MU69. And that flyby is 55 weeks from today, one year and three weeks from today, on the 1st of January, 2019. In addition, though, because we're in the Kuiper Belt with these remote sensing instruments, we're able to make unique studies of dozens of other Kuiper Belt objects, both dwarf planets in the distance, relatively bright targets, and uh, small KBOs to give us context for both Pluto and for MU69. So uh, there's a great poster, for example, by Ann Verbisher uh, on the initial results of um, uh, high phase angle studies of some of these targets, which only we can provide because we're out there uh, observing at angles that can't be observed. We're also able to look for satellites with resolution that Hubble can't obtain because we're in the Kuiper Belt and we're able to do high, high, high phase resolution measurements to look for evidence of rings around both Kuiper Belt objects and centaurs that you couldn't do easily uh, from the Earth. And in addition, our plasma suite and the dust instrument are making a uh, transect all the way across the Kuiper Belt out to the distance of Pluto's aphelion, operating almost 24-7, following on the Voyager um, uh, exploration of this region with plasma instruments, but no dust instrument. Uh, and our UV spectrometer is tomographing the neutral hydrogen distribution um, throughout the Kuiper Belt. For our flyby on the 1st of January 2019, I'll tell you a little bit about the target and that, that um, upper left artist's conception of the target is something that Mark Bowie will be talking extensively about a little bit later in this session. This is a, um, um, a red KBO, a classical KBO, uh, uh, classical, cold classical KBO, which means it's basically a bedrock sample of the material um, at 44 astronomical units. It should teach us a great deal, uh, not just about the KBO population, but about the small bodies that built the dwarf planets like Pluto. Um, we believe that it's either a binary or perhaps a trinary, um, and we're going to fly much closer to it than we flew to Pluto. 3,500 kilometers versus about 12,000 kilometers. So mapping, composition mapping, searches for satellites and rings, searches for coma, which we don't expect, but we might find. And I'll just close because I see my chairs are standing up and they want me to finish um, by saying, uh, I can't wait till we get to the decadal survey to talk about more exploration of the Pluto system and the Kuiper Belt. Thank you. We do not have time for questions. We have to move right on to the next speaker. So our next speaker is Leslie Young, and she will talk about Pluto's surface composition and atmosphere. Hello, New Orleans. <laughs> So uh, yes, I'll be speaking about uh, let's see, the um, only two topics. So uh, I will, as soon as I find out how to advance, Pluto's surface composition and atmosphere, which actually are two tightly related topics. Um, so Pluto's surface composition, it's such a tightly related pair of comment uh, topics because um, Three of the ices that we see on Pluto's surface are volatile, uh, nitrogen, uh, carbon dioxide, and methane. Uh, the vapor pressures are significant, so at 12 microbars for nitrogen and uh, about 1,000 times smaller than that for methane. So that's 
uh, what forms up Pluto's atmosphere. And then there's also volatile pore areas on Pluto as well. So um, these are the species that, these are uh, Lisa spectra at two different locations taken from Sylvia Protopapa's paper. I'll be showing uh, spectra from her paper and uh, also other conclusions. Most of my composition maps will be coming from uh, those three sources, particularly Bernard Schmidt's paper. Um, so you'll be hearing more about color in Kathy Olkin's talk, but uh, you can think of color as a guide to composition, and I've outlined some of the um, areas on Pluto. Most significantly, uh, Tombo Regio is the heart-shaped uh, uh, area for the bright heart on Pluto. Sputnik Planitia is the nitrogen-rich basin with uh, uh, convecting nitrogen, and Cthulhu Regio is the large dark area near the equator. In uh, water, um, uh, you see that um, the water is mainly at the equator where you get runaway albedo feedbacks, as described by Elisa Earle and others, um, and a trend of water toward uh, tholin material in Cthulhu Regio. Some mysteries, like why this area, which otherwise in the visible looks completely innocuous, is this water-rich area. Uh, if we map uh, nitrogen, which is by far the most volatile species on Pluto, we can see uh, the nitrogen filling up Sputnik Planitia, changes in grain size over Sputnik Planitia, but also a broad band of nitrogen at mid-latitudes, and then it favors um, uh, low-lying areas. Um, that lake that Alan showed is one example of uh, areas that are um, flat and smooth and low and nitrogen covered. Uh, the methane is much more ubiquitous, and we all love methane because it interacts in light, uh, with light, and uh, does many marvelous things because of that, and one of them is you can observe it well in uh, the infrared. Um, so this is a combination of Bernard Schmidt's near-infrared map and the um, visible wavelength methane map from Alyssa Earle, which has about 10 times higher spatial resolution than the infrared map. Um, and you can see a change in the methane dilution. Um, you can see methane on the top of bladed terrains, on the top of mountain crests, uh, at the top of rimmed craters, um, and at the low areas, either it is absent or it is finer grained when you have objects, uh, sorry, frosts and ices that are finer grained, then the spectral features are less uh, distinct, which is why we cannot tell aspirin from anthrax. Um, if you put the three colors together, um, this is a, a nice way to look at some of the trends. So for the last 40 years, we've been getting uh, sunlight at mid-latitudes. For the last 20 years, the pole has been getting um, sunlight as well. So maybe there's two different sublimation fronts leaving nitrogen at the mid-latitudes. The beating heart of Pluto, Sputnik Planitia, is several kilometers deep, so we're not going to run out of that nitrogen anytime soon. Um, and then uh, seeing, uh, the, again, the results of the runaway albedo feedback at the equator. So, um, and I'm just going to go back and forth a couple of times here, because I actually have just a minute or two to do that, so you can see. Um, how the color can inform the volatiles. We have data at lower resolution um, filling in these missing areas, uh, which have yet to be analyzed. And then also a treat is running along here is um, higher resolution spectral data um, at about a few kilometers per pixel. So gave you a feel for the icy world of Pluto, the, the nitrogen, methane, icy worlds, uh, Triton and Titan, um, Eris and probably others in the outer solar system are also of these exotic ices. Uh, but now let's transition from the surface to the atmosphere. And when you look at the atmosphere of Pluto, you actually have to think about Titan a lot. The conditions in the upper atmosphere of, uh, oh, sorry, in Pluto's atmosphere are similar to those in Pluto's uh, stratosphere. And when I talk about the atmosphere, I'll, I'm going to say I put in one, one provocative line, and we'll see if anybody can spot it. So this is the overview of Pluto's atmosphere. I'm going to keep a post, uh, postage stamp version of this slide up in the upper corner for the remainder of the talk, because 
uh, time is short and it's hard, it's easy to get lost. But basically, we have a, a boundary layer uh, and surface interaction. Um, as I said, we have significant volatile transport, uh, volatile pressure um, above uh, nitrogen, methane, and uh, carbon monoxide. Um, strong heating due to um, uh, probably methane heating. Um, in the lower atmosphere, you have horizontal variation, then it becomes homogeneous. Somewhere at about 300 kilometers, uh, we, we form the haze by condensation or nucleation, and then up at about 500 to 1,000 kilometers of um, altitude are the uh, uh, photochemistry, the nitrogen ionization and the methane dissociation. So uh, yes, Pluto has an atmosphere, um, and it's a significant one. It's global, which means it can move volatiles around the entire surface. It's opaque to UV, fully collisional uh, with complicated energetics, chemistry, um, and dynamics. So there I am sticking it in the corner. Um, okay, so uh, we um, can measure the composition um, from New Horizons through the um, uh, UV occultation. The radio occultation gave us the pressure down here, connecting the dots uh, between the, pressure, the pressures measured down here and the pressures measured by the UV, tells us that it's a cold upper atmosphere. We measure the methane, you can see that the ratio of the methane to the nitrogen gets um, uh, smaller as you go up. You can see the diffusive separation. Uh, our models um, are favoring a very stable lower atmosphere with the homopause only at about five to 12 kilometers. Uh, other research uh, researchers are um, having different results, so that is going to be an interesting thing to sort out. Uh, the methane is, um, uh, turns into the C2 hydrocarbons here, um, C2H2, H4, H6, um, and those are somehow, somehow eventually the source of the haze that we detect. Um, and not only do we, um, oh, so onto the boundary layer, uh, a big question before New Horizons arrived at Pluto was, did Pluto have a tropopause? And the answer is, it depends on where you are. And I think this is really cool that the place where we see a boundary layer, we can't tell from our data whether this is isothermal or adiabatic, but um, the, the entry of the radio occultation occurred uh, over Sputnik Planitia at dusk. So for an entire half Pluto day, three days, three Earth days, uh, Sputnik Planitia had been absorbing sunlight, subliming nitrogen, pumping it into the atmosphere. You don't have to lose uh, very much nitrogen ice to have a significant amount of uh, nitrogen um, gas. So if you, um, half, a, half a Pluto day of sublimation gives you about 10 kilometers of new cold nitrogen gas. So I like to think of this as this piston once a day pumping up and down over Sputnik Planitia. And models also show winds flowing out of Sputnik Planitia during the day and back in at night. Um, here you can see the large thermal gradients making a stable atmosphere uh, in both ingress and egress. Um, this regular breathing, this piston going up and down, might be a source of uh, gravitational waves leading to the layering that we see in Pluto's haze. Um, and uh, these are very long wavelength, very coherent. Uh, on Earth, it's not odd to see um, gravity waves with horizontal wavelengths of 1,000 kilometers, but Pluto only has about 1,200 kilometer radius, so it's um, more startling on such a small body. Uh, we don't know what these are yet, um, or what shape they are. Uh, it appears that they're probably um, fractal aggregates, is one way to explain both its blue color and uh, the highly forward scattering um, nature. And I'm, uh, and sorry, I was messing with my timer. Um, I guess, sorry about that. And um, I am uh, moved pretty sprightly. So I will leave this uh, slide with my many questions up. Um, questions for you, and then you can have questions for me. <coughs> so uh, we saw these signs of a sublimation uh, sublimation fronts, so maybe evidence of how methane and nitrogen has moved over the last year, and, but also with things like the large um, uh, Cthulhu Regio, uh, how things have lasted over uh, the last obliquity cycle of millions of years. We 
see that Pluto fa uh, that methane favors high altitudes, uh, but we don't know yet why. Nitrogen favors depths, um, but it's actually a very subtle effect, so that looks like it might be a multi-season effect and not just a Pluto uh, single 250-year Pluto season. Uh, we see these gradients in um, Sputnik Planitia, and it might be related to how it uh, sublimes from the north end of Sputnik and condenses in the south. Um, uh, new uh, models by uh, Bertrand, uh, Tange Bertrand, for example, are, are suggesting that. Um, there's a haze, and it's pretty uniform over Pluto, and it should condense. Um, so why isn't Pluto all of the same color? Why doesn't it all look haze-colored, whatever that color is? Um, we don't know where the tholins are formed. Are they formed in the atmosphere or the surface? Uh, it'll change if the, at, right now, the atmosphere is opaque to UV. Um, if the atmosphere collapses, or even if, as Tian pointed out to me this morning, we don't have to collapse the atmosphere, we just have to lose the methane in the atmosphere. If the atmosphere becomes transparent to UV, uh, we could form it on the surface. Uh, we see variation in the temperature near the surface. Does the composition change as well from place to place? Uh, what is the global circulation? We are seeing features that seem to be related to wind, you know, perhaps the onset of the formation of the, the pits, the small pits in Smutik Planitia might be wind direction driven. Um, and right now there are at least three uh, ideas that have been put out for why Pluto's upper atmosphere is cold, um, which is an unusual number to feel like we know the answer yet. Uh, so what cools the upper atmosphere and how does that affect Pluto's long-term escape? So uh, I'll leave this up with these questions and hopefully it'll spark others from you. Thank you. Time for questions. Are any questions? There's no microphone, so you have to speak up and we may need to repeat your question. Um, so I have a question. Okay, what about those hazes and cooling? Um, I don't think I can give a, a coherent off answer off the cuff. I'm sorry. Oh, so go read Daryl Strauss' yes. um, uh, Nature Paper is what you're saying. Uh, yes, there's a new paper, uh, uh, Zheng and Strobel. So uh, the, three, um, the three, ideas, uh, three ideas for what cools Pluto's upper atmosphere um, Two of them are by uh, Daryl and colleagues, and one is not. So uh, he suggested it. We know that water is um, flowing into Pluto because we have measured uh, the dust near Pluto, and you can um, infer how much of that is water. So there's water coming in. And, and if the water is super saturated, then uh, it might be responsible for the cooling. Um, also, uh, Ethane, uh, Roger Yell presented at EPSC that ethane may be responsible for the cooling. And then finally, uh, Daryl Strobel's uh, recent paper, Zheng and Strobel, uh, suggests that the haze that we see in Pluto's atmosphere may be responsible both for uh, some heating lower down and then cooling at, at height. Okay, any other questions? Boy, very well behaved group. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Okay, the next um, paper will be uh, presented by Kathy Olkin, uh, The Color of Pluto from New Horizons. All right, so I'm going to follow up on some themes that you heard earlier from Alan and Leslie, and I'm going to talk about the color uh, of Pluto. You can see the cast of characters here. Um, some feature names are informal and others are formal. I won't get into the details. Um, as you heard from uh, Alan, we had observations on approach, and, in fa and I'm showing here the 16 images uh, that we had on approach covering about five days uh, before close encounter. This does not include the highest resolution image that I'll show you in just a minute, but you can see, let's see. Maybe it's easier to show over here. And you can see there's a, a wire grid showing the longitude, the zero longitude and the equator, so you can orient yourself 
uh, to Pluto, and uh, you can see that we went from lower resolution to higher resolution as the spacecraft was getting closer to Pluto. This uh, image here is about 127 kilometers per pixel, while this one is just under five kilometers per pixel, and the one you'll see on the next page is about uh, 0.6 to 0.7 kilometers per pixel. These, what I'm gonna be showing are enhanced color images. What you saw previously were more natural color. The enhanced color is used, is derived by using the blue, red, and near IR filters on New Horizons and putting those into R, G, and B just to produce an image uh, as if these were R, G, and B. So that's what you're seeing here. And this is our highest resolution image of Pluto and, and there's a lot more detail than you can see here on the screen. You can zoom in and see all sorts of details at this 0.66 kilometers per pixel. Once again, here's a wire grid showing the orientation. So this is the anti-Karen side of Pluto. And what you're seeing here is a color-color diagram. So the ratio of the red to blue and near IR to red for each of the pixels in this image. And they're plotted on here. The color scale bar for each of these pixel, each of these points is elevation. And it goes uh, from minus five kilometers plus three kilometers. And um, when I'm producing an image like this, they, the points end up on top of each other. So the next image I'm going to show you is kind of deconstructing that color-color diagram and showing you in each of the different one-kilometer bins what the color-color diagram would look like. And so this is the lowest elevation from minus five kilometers to minus four kilometers. And you can see on this same color-color diagram, red to blue and near IR to red, uh, that most of these points here are near neutral. The neutral point here is the intersection of the vertical and the horizontal line given by this dot right here. So the lowest elevation are near, uh, near neutral, and I'll show you later that that's really that these are volatile ices. And then you can see as you increase in altitude um, that you end up uh, uh, spreading across the color color diagram. So this quadrant up here is the very red pixels here. And you can see there's this other, there's basically two color mixing lines. There's this one that goes from relatively neutral out to red. And then there's this other one right here that you can see most predominantly in the highest uh, elevation bin. And I'm going to focus in on that in just a second. So that's now I've taken that same color color diagram. I've uh, binned uh, three by three just for ease of presentation and for plotting purposes. And I'm able to select the pixels in this color color diagram and overplot them on the image of Pluto. And so you can see that this color mixing line here corresponds to this terrain here, which appears yellow in the enhanced color diagram. And this, uh, this material is uh, preferentially located in the uh, to the north and at higher elevation. And you can see that here, this is the higher elevation piece. This is that same terrain. Looking at the predominant mixing, color mixing line here, this one where most of the pixels on the body are, we can take this apart and I'm gonna show you uh, the most red terrain and then work my way down to the more neutral terrain. So you can see the most red terrain really is at the heart of Cthulhu Regio. You can see it identified here. Uh, there's a fossa here, which is why this is, uh, uh, so this is a different, different elevation and it happens to have a slightly different color. And so this, heart of Cthulhu Regio, which is the most red terrain, um, aligns very well with the permanent diurnal zone uh, that you see between 13 degrees south latitude and 13 degrees north latitude. This is presented in Rick's paper on climate zones on Pluto and Charon. And so this region has been experiencing diurnal cycles of insulation over the last 20 million years. And so over time, it's believed that basically the volatile ices have been baked off of this region and then deposited into the north or the southern, southern pole. Um, and as Leslie mentioned in her talk, you know, this, this is a depression and there's a deep trough, a reservoir of volatile ices here. So this is a, a little, Sputnik Planitia and Tombaugh Regio are a little bit different case than 
than the explanation that explains why this is dark. So if we keep going down this color, color, this color mixing line, you can see the next uh, region, which is a little bit less red terrain, which would be very hard to pick out by your eye, but you can see it in the diagram, really encircles this. And going here, you're now this main part uh, is a boundary on either end, and you could see that very easily visually that it's a transition zone, and you also saw that in Leslie's slides. And if you just select kind of the, the heart of this center area, you can see it's a large area. It corresponds to many pixels on Pluto. And these are uh, uh, where there's a lot of volatile ices. And here you can see that transition between the northern part of Sputnik Planitia and the southern or more, more southern part of Sputnik Planitia that Leslie was talking about here. This area that's the that is not selected in this region is that yellow terrain that I was telling you about. And so it kind of all fits together. And I wanted to tell you about this kind of unusual red area. There's a, some pixels on Pluto that show this kind of unusual red color. It's, you can probably best see it right here. This is Elliott Crater. This is Virgil Fossa. So this is a trough. It's a low-lying area. It also has um, water ice in this area, and so you, if we try and pull out those pixels from the color color diagram, they're, they're associated right here. It's a little hard to see on the screen, but they're here, and those correspond to these troughs, and you can see this is um, one of Paul Shank's uh, topographic maps, and so you can see that these are, in fact, top topographic lows, and they correspond to uh, water ice uh, being on the surface here, and so this, this Unusual red color is a uh, combination of both lows and water ice. And we can look and do the same trick uh, across all those other observations that we had on approach to Pluto. You can see this one, which I showed before, the 127 kilometer per pixel maps to this color color diagram here. And once again, I'm showing the same near IR to red versus red to blue. And you can see um, in all of these images, you're seeing the North Pole of Pluto, and so you see, you know, the, this near neutral region, and you can kind of see the yellow region once you get more uh, pixels on Pluto to be able to pull that out. And so, in conclusion, um, there's two distinct mixing lines on Pluto that you can see in the color color diagrams. Both share a common origin, and that's the neutral terrain, which is the volatile ices, and then the predominant color mixing line contends, uh, is a transition into the dark red tholins that you have in Cthulhu Regio. And the minor uh, mixing line is that red terrain in the, northern in the northern latitudes associated with higher elevations. And there's a clear latitudinal dependence on the red terrain. And if you want to see more, you can look at a recent page paper in AJ where these results are presented. Questions? Great, I can ask my question, okay. which is I've always wanted to know whether or not that um, upper yellowy whole top, top region is the same material as the um, uh, Cthulhu Regio. Cthulhu, yeah. So um, I don't believe it is the same material because the, the color looks very different and it's a different but I'm not sure what's driving it. I think it could be a type of tholin driven by either different energetic processes to produce it or uh, different compositional starting points. Uh, but since it's not following the same color mixing line, I really don't think it's, it's the same th dark tholins that we have at Cthulhu Regio. I would expect that if it was just forming and would eventually end up there, that it would have formed along that same line. But um, I don't know what it is, but I think we're getting hints now with the fact that where it's localized to, and so that's telling us something about the insulation and the pattern, and, and that it's at high elevations, and I'm not sure quite what that tells us yet, but um, that's the next step. Okay, so you can't answer why. I can't answer why, okay. and if I did, I would have said it, because <laughs> it would have been great to say it. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. The next talk.
um, is uh, the cosmic chemistry of Pluto, a primordial <coughs> origin of volatiles, and will be given by Chris Glein. Just switch the keyboard here real quick. Sure. I should mention, for your sake as well the, as the other talks, um, the remaining talks are 12 minutes, and they're all, you're yellow, your light will turn yellow uh, when there's eight minutes elapsed, and you have four minutes left, and you should wrap up and take questions. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. <coughs> okay, well, thank you. In today's talk, what I'm hoping to convey is that the unveiling of Pluto doesn't just allow for an appreciation of its spectacular surface geology, but we can now also begin to explore the origins of its chemistry. <clears throat> and over the next 10 slides, I'm going to be focusing on nitrogen, molecular nitrogen, N2, which really plays a key role on Pluto. It's the key volatile that enables surface activity on the cold surface environment of this remote world. Uh, number one, it's the dominant observed constituent in Sputnik Planitia, which of course is the most prominent geological feature on Pluto. N2 is also the most abundant gas in Pluto's atmosphere. And thirdly, it seems like it has this interesting role in geomorphology in both its solid form as glaciers and also in its ability to sublimate and create these interesting pitted features. So given its fundamental role on Pluto, it's natural for a geochemist like myself to ask, well, where the heck did this stuff come from? So I'm hoping to try to tackle that question in the next few slides. Um, this isn't Pluto, but it's a body that can help us to understand Pluto. From numerous studies of Titan's mysterious atmosphere, we've gained an understanding that there were three important reservoirs of nitrogen in the early solar system. The first is primordial nitrogen, so this is where a body would have nitrogen because it's simply accreted nitrogen in that form. And then there's two other forms of nitrogen, ammonia and organic materials. And so to convert these to molecular nitrogen, you would need to invoke chemistry, some kind of high energy process to drive this chemistry, like photochemistry, impacts, or hydrothermal processes. And these have all been discussed in the literature on Titan. Titan has been a phenomenal testing ground for these types of ideas because we've gained an appreciation that there are three fundamental tests that have proved, proven to be very useful for testing these types of hypotheses. The first is just to invoke a simple mass balance. Can you explain the observed amount of nitrogen on a body from one of these hypothetical precursor sources? The second and third, they rely upon more elaborate and detailed chemical arguments and specific chemical information. So we don't have that type of information on Pluto. So for this presentation, we're going to focus on the simplest possibility, so a primordial origin of nitrogen, and then also the simplest test, which is a mass balance test. But it's still nevertheless phenomenal that we can even start to contemplate these things for Pluto. So over the next few slides, I'm just going to walk you through a, a, an estimate of trying to inventory how much N2 Pluto might have. So the first obvious reservoir of nitrogen is in the atmosphere. So we can just use the atmospheric pressure that's been determined by the REX instrument from New Horizons. And the surface pressure is about 10 microbar, one pascal. And we can solve, so what would be the mass of the atmosphere? And that works out to about 10 to the 15 moles of N2. So I'm a chemist, so I'm a, I'm a mole lover. <coughs> um, so the next two are a little more cryptic, so you have to bear with me here. These are really just first order estimates. So we really want to try and understand what's the total escaped inventory. And this is a hard problem, right? So what we can do is we can start with the present day of escape, which has been estimated based on the thermal and compositional structure of the upper atmosphere from New Horizons data analysis. And then what I've done is I've just performed a simple extrapolation by scaling that rate by the time variable solar fluxes of high energy radiation in the extreme ultraviolet and lima alpha, alpha photons. So if we do that type of very simple extrapolation, we get about five times 10 to the 16 moles of N2 that could have been lost. Photochemistry is another way that you can lose nitrogen on a body like Pluto or Titans, right? So nitrogen can be incorporated in photochemically derived compounds like HCN. 
So I've looked at the recent photochemical model by Wang et al, and you can see that there are three photochemically derived species that would contain nitrogen. They're all nitriles, they're predicted to form. HCN's been observed. So if we just use these values, we can try to estimate what would be the present day photochemical flux. And again, I've just performed this simple scaling argument to try to extrapolate back in time. If we do that, we get about two times 10 to the 18th moles of photochemical N2. And the last one, this is where I think New Horizons was phenomenal in helping us, is on Titan, the problem is easy, right? We have this massive atmosphere that we can sort of observe re readily. But on Pluto, a lot of the nitrogen is frozen, and Sputnik Planitia actually offers a great opportunity. I was actually, my mind was blown when I first realized this, because we have estimates from just certain uh, imaging observations of the surface area of this deposit, and then there's been these interpretations that this deposit is probably convecting because of these polygonal cells and also it's very young age from cratering studies. So if we put those two factors together, we can get an estimate of the volume. And from the volume, then we just have to try to figure out, well, can spectroscopy inform us for what its composition could be? At least the optical surface seems to be dominated by nitrogen ice. So I'm going to provisionally estimate something like 50 to 100% N2. So if we put all three of these factors together, we can estimate of order 10 to the 20th moles of N2 potentially present in Sputnik Planitia. Summing the totals together, this is interesting, it appears that Sputnik Planitia is the apparent dominant reservoir of nitrogen on Pluto. And this is basically a consequence of the much lower rate of atmospheric escaped that has been learned from New Horizons studies. So that's our mass balance constraint from an observational point of view. Uh, let's see what theory might suggest. So I'm going to use comets as our model for um, primordial N2. And it turns out we're lucky because the Rosetta mission had the first measurement of molecular nitrogen in a comet. So we have an estimate, we have a value for one comet at least, of the N2 to CO ratio. We can combine that number with ranges of CO to H2O ratio in numerous comets. It's about 1 to 10 percent is a typical range. And then we can also use the estimate of the water content of Pluto from New Horizons. So this arises from the bulk density interpreted in terms of a two-component mixing model of water and rock. And so we get about two times 10 to the 23rd moles of water. So we, with those values, we can, we can evaluate this equation. And then here's what the parameter space looks like for this predicted primordial N2. So this is the predicted amount as a function of the CO to H2O ratio in the building blocks of Pluto. And then I've just considered nitrogen to CO ratios that are within the comet 67p value by a factor of two. So that's what theory suggests. Here's the range derived from the simplistic analysis of Sputnik Planitia. So, you know, it's about 10 to 20th is the order. And what's interesting about this comparison is there's actually quite a wide range of consistency space here. Not the whole region of the theoretical space is consistent, but a great deal of it is. So I find that to be very intriguing. So from my interpretation, it, it's not a slam dunk case, but it appears that this primordial N2 hypothesis has some interesting quality to it, and it survives this initial mass balance test. So you might think that, well, we can just start dancing because this is great. Um, there's actually a problem. So I, I'd like to just confront that head on now. And this was actually recognized by um, Toby Owen and colleagues many years ago, a few decades ago now, when they first discovered N2 on the surface of Pluto. It turns out that Pluto's N2 to CO ratio is pretty low. And if you look at the value that's arrived in Comet 67P, it's pretty high. So what's going on there? And it doesn't seem like it's just Pluto. This problem appears to be common among large Kuiper belt type objects like Neptune's moon Triton. Um, one possibility is that I'm just dead wrong, and maybe the source of nitrogen could be ammonia or organic nitrogen. But if we think the mass balance argument might be kind of interesting enough, let's pursue primordial N2 a little further. So there's two other possibilities. One is that the CO could be buried perhaps inside Sputnik Planitia at depth. And the second possibility is that maybe CO was destroyed in a subsurface ocean. And this was proposed long ago for Triton by, um, I think, Gandhi and Stevenson. Uh, McKinnon and Schock revisited this. So this is an old problem that's received some theoretical attention. Um, here's how the CO burial model works. So imagine that we start with the cometary 67p value of the CO to N2 ratio. And we like to ask ourselves, could this evolve by this 
freezing out processes of gases from the atmosphere to get you to Pluto's CO to N2 ratio. So what I've considered is I've considered a case of equilibrium crystallization. So you can imagine if you freeze gases out, you form a big chunk of ice, and then that whole chunk is always at equilibrium with the atmosphere. That's this trajectory here, and you can see it's not nearly efficient enough to lower your CO to N2 ratio. Uh, the other case is a fractional crystallization trajectory. So this is where you freeze stuff out, and then the stuff that's buried at the bottom no longer equilibrates with the atmosphere. It's only the uppermost layer that still equilibrates. And so you can that, see that process really drives the ratio low. In fact, when you get towards where Pluto is, the ratio is vanishingly small. And that's simply a consequence on Pluto that almost all the volatiles are frozen out. So anything that's left over can be massively fractionated. You can see Pluto lies between these curves, so what do you suppose that might mean? Um, well, one interpretation is that maybe it means that there's some kind of balancing act going on on Pluto where you could imagine if you had a quiescent Pluto, you'd follow this fractional crystallization trend, but because of the dynamism of convection on Sputnik Planitia, that process is always trying to move you back up towards equilibrium, and Pluto's kind of stuck in the middle. So that could be a, a, an interpretation, it's a partial Rayleigh model, I call it. So that's one possibility. Um, the other possibility is a CO destruction model. So CO, if you don't know, is actually unstable in contact with liquid water. It reacts with the OH minus the hydroxide ion in liquid water to make the species formate, which is a simple organic compound. And then that formate can then subsequently decarboxylate to make bicarbonate and hydrogen. So what I did is I created a simple numerical model to explore this chemical system. And here's what that looks like. So what I've considered for both of these cases is Enceladus-like conditions zero degrees Celsius ocean on Pluto at a pH of nine. And the difference between these two is this has more hydrogen dissolved in the solution, so it's a reduced case. This is the oxidized case with many orders of magnitude less hydrogen. And in both cases, what's interesting is you can see the CO just comes crashing down by about nine orders of magnitude in less than a billion years, I mean less than a million years. So this is a remarkably fast geological process. So, from this, the, both of these comparisons, I think that both of these processes seem viable and they need to be studied in greater detail. And I just want to emphasize that they're not mutually exclusive, too. I think Pluto is surprising us. And given its complexity, there might actually be many different geochemical processes that have affected its chemistry. Thank you. Very quick question. Yes. Yes, so that would be an apparent observed amount. Anything that's in clathrates dissolved in a liquid water ocean, this is very difficult to treat theoretically. OK, okay quick. Can you make CO2? You could from the bicarbonate ion. So there's a pH dependence, and it gets into some interesting questions about similarities and differences between Pluto and Triton, because Triton has CO2 on its surface. Okay. Thanks, Great. Chris. Thanks. So the next speaker is, in fact, my uh, co-convener, um, Kelsey Singer, who's going to talk about cryovolcanic resurfacing on Pluto. Take it away. Thanks, Fran. All right, I'm going to dive right in here. The region of interest for these putative cryovolcanic constructs is just at the tip of Pluto's heart here, and there's a number of interesting um, features. For the sake of time, I'm going to talk mainly about the um, main informally named Wright Mons feature shown here, and it's got a very large central depression, and then some of the surrounding terrains. Oh, I got to start this. So, to introduce you to this feature, maybe. Um, <laughs> okay, that's, I think I'm going to stop that. Um, it, I swear it worked in the speaker ready room, but I have a, a backup. Oh, 
Okay, sorry the video didn't work. You can watch it some other time. Um, but the, the feature itself is about 150 kilometers across. The central depression is quite large. I have some topographic profiles um, in a couple of slides. But it takes up almost a third of the feature. It's about 40 kilometers across. Um, it's four kilometers high. And um, in addition, there's a number of other large depressions on the sides that do not look like impact craters. And speaking of, there are very few, if any, um, confirmed impact craters on this structure, which gives us an idea that it's probably quite young, relatively speaking. There's very few individual flows. If you can see this a, a little bit darker region here, um, I'll show also in the topography this is higher, and so this is potentially um, one example of a distinct flow. And then there's this hummocky texture on the flanks of Wright Mons. It's got about a characteristic size of about 8 to 10 kilometers across for each hummock. And then there's even a smaller texture you can see superimposed on here that could be blocks or ridges. It's a little bit hard to tell because it's getting close to the limit of our resolution. And then some of these terrains that are a little bit farther away, um, for example, this one shares this kind of hummocky look to the flanks of the mound, but it's more fractured and broken up, and so we've been speculating that these could potentially be an older um, version of whatever created these uh, terrains. In this figure, I have stretched the interior of the depression. So this is the central depression here. And you can see the texture is pretty similar to that on the outside of the um, mons. And there's no obvious hole or um, vent structure, but it's potentially that could have been filled in um, at some point. And we don't know for sure that the material is actually moving from the center to the outside, um, but a couple of hints that, that might be happening, as you can see in the topography here, it's not perfectly circular, but it's got a nice round structure around this central depression. Um, and if it's true that some of these other terrains are older, you see these older ones a little bit farther away from what could be the, the central part of this structure. And last but not least, the floor of the central depression is quite deep. So the whole thing's about four kilometers, and the central depression itself is either at or below the level of the surrounding terrain. So this profile is very different than what we see for, say, volcanic features on Earth or even on Mars. If we pretend like we are flooding right mons, um, we can, I just actually mentioned too that over here is the Tenzing Montes, which is not included in this main structure, but we can estimate the volume of material that needed to be mobilized to create this mound. Um, and it's about seven times 10 to the fourth cubic kilometers which is uh, interestingly fairly similar to the volume of material in Mauna Loa, even though the shape of these features is very different, just gives you a reference frame. So very briefly summarizing some of the um, observations that we're trying to match here when we're thinking about how this feature formed. It appears to be relatively young, it doesn't look like it was created yesterday, um, but there's very few identifiable impact craters on it. There's a fair amount of material that went into making this feature, and it's got these interesting textures on it. Uh, so this begs the question, of course, and this has come up before in some of the earlier talks. Um, Alan mentioned what could this potential heat source be for um, later activity on Pluto. Would be nice to know what makes up this mound. And I just put a whole bunch of question marks here because we have a lot of different thoughts floating about about how you might be able to get the textures that we see on the sides of the mound. This is a very brief history of the internal heat on Pluto. Um, Pluto, in very broad bulk terms, is about two-thirds rock and one-third ice. And we think that tidal heating should have ended fairly early in the Pluto-Sharon um, system history, um, so not too long after the Sharon forming impact. And so we don't think tides should play a role in any of the later history of Pluto. Radiogenic heating has been always fairly low on Pluto. In the more recent times, probably less than about five milliwatts per meter squared. Could have been a little bit higher in the past, but we think these are relatively recent features. Um, and despite all of that, there is modeling to suggest that you could maintain a subsurface ocean on Pluto. So this would be to below the entire ice layer that you see there. Um, but that's not necessarily what we think is forming this particular mound. At least we don't see, um, it doesn't look like low viscosity or fluid-like flows created the mound. 
So in conclusion about the heat flow, we don't know, there's no obvious source for why we would have later activity on Pluto, um, but we, are, we need some creative ideas, um, things that could be potentially storing energy from a past event um, or from something else in Pluto's past, and then for some reason this heat is getting out later in time. So we heard about the LISA instrument in a few of the earlier talks, and I just have a couple of um, derived products here. The one on the left is methane, um, the one on the right is H2O, and I should say red is indicating higher abundance here, and I'll refer you to um, these papers by um, Bernard Schmidt and Sylvia Protopapa for lots of fun details about the composition. But I want to emphasize here that this methane that we're seeing is, we believe, all atmospheric um, products. So ice freezing out of Pluto's atmosphere onto the surface. So we think this is mostly not a giant um, thing of methane, but it's the methane itself is hiding what else could be here, because it's a pretty strong signal. And there are a few spots of water, however, especially this is the central depression region here. And so that's good, because we do think there's water there. And so we do at least see some signs of it where it's not being covered over by methane. And also this is the potential distinct flow feature, which seems to have some water signature as well. And I will wrap up here um, with our, some ideas about uh, what basically a working list of how we could potentially form this feature because it's pretty unique in its shape and scale um, compared to what we see elsewhere in the solar system. Could we be seeing these textures formed from some kind of viscous flow, water plus some kind of antifreeze? We don't see signs of ammonia, but that doesn't mean it isn't there or wasn't there in the past. Um, could nitrogen ice or even liquid nitrogen mobilize the other materials um, and bring them to this location? Pressurized water eruptions are often thought about for icy worlds, uh, although there's been an affiliate of the team who's been looking at this already and it doesn't seem like it's necessarily a super efficient way to form this kind of feature on Pluto. Of course, there's a bunch of volatiles that you've been hearing about, um, and how could those be involved in either creating the mound itself or the textures that we see on top of it? And there's been an idea put forth also that maybe these hummocks are individual domes. It's a little harder for me to think about how you would get that at a, such a nice consistent size, but it's still something that we're exploring. This is my personal favorite. I like the toothpaste um, <laughs> model <laughs> formation of uh, right mons and thinking about getting these textures from viscous flow. Uh, but I will put to be continued up here because we're thinking of ways to test all these different hypotheses um, and we welcome collaborations on this. And last but not least, since I'm running out of time, I will put up one potential analog, not for the shape of the entire right mons itself, but for the hummocky terrain. And for those of you who are familiar with Enceladus, um, the terrain in between the famous tiger stripes is known as funicular terrain. And you can see it has this interesting hummocky texture, and it even has some smaller scale um, boulders there. And um, I'll just put up Earth and Pluto here to be my shout out to having giant pahoehoe on Pluto. Um, and I'll leave you with this final view of Wright Mons and take questions. Questions from the audience? I think we're all just as flummoxed. <laughs> There's one at the back. There's stairs on the other side. Well, I like your ammonia water idea too. And of course, you might get rid of the ammonia through uh, catalysis and then making hydrazine and eventually M2. So uh, what gives you the nice viscosity might be gotten rid of fairly quickly. Yeah, I agree. And um, it would be nice to see it, but it's we do see it on Sharon. It's Definitely possibly elsewhere in the system, but it's definitely um, thinking something we're keeping in mind. Uh, Alan? Yes, I'll meet the witness. Is this an isolated feature? Uh, th yes, Alan's asking if Wright Mons is an isolated feature, and um, I thank you for asking that. We do have other features potentially similar. Uh, oh, wait, I have the mouse is over here. Um, real quick. Sure. There even is one potentially of similar form, which is just to the south of Wright Mons, which we were able to see in haze light, which is pretty amazing. Um, I often say that I've never been so excited about an atmosphere before. Um, <laughs> but we could even do, um, Paul's even managed to extract some stereotopography out of it. And you can see it's another lar large mound with a central depression, not exactly the same, but shares a lot of similarities. Um, I'm also a fan of the terrain to the west
this terrain, this large plateau here to the west, which I didn't have time to talk about, is fairly crater-free as well, and has a number of weird depressions and potentially some flow features in it. Um, and then there's a few other features scattered across Pluto um, that are mysterious, and we're still trying to figure out quite how they formed. Yep. Yes, indeed. Okay. Yes? Um, I don't think I agree with what I'm about to suggest, but. <laughs> 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 well, like, you're trying to say it's like Ian? <laughs> but I'm just wondering if, if you think the hummocks could be enhanced by sublimation or even, I mean, I don't know. They seem. Yeah, we did try to think of some, um, if you could have a volatile thing that could create kind of some kind of pattern like that. But it is a very large scale. It's almost 10 kilometers across. Um, and they're just very regular to me. Um, but it's, it's not that easy to get regular textures that many different ways. Um, so yes, and I, one, real quick, one thought we did have is that we are going to try and extract some of that methane signature um, and see what else is left behind when we do that. OK, great. Thank you very much. Let's uh, go back over to that one. And our next talk is by Hal Weaver. He's going to talk about small bodies in the Kuiper Belt lessons from Pluto's very bizarre small satellites. And so just these Oops. Yeah. Your recorder is hiding up there. Oh, how about the, you don't have a. You can try this. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be addressing the question of uh, how can we use the lessons learned from the New Horizons results on the small satellites of the Pluto system to inform our knowledge of the, small, the other small bodies in the Kuiper belt. And what I mean by small is roughly speaking less than 500 kilometers in diameter. Uh, for those of you who know about absolute magnitudes, uh, for an albedo of about 10%, that's a absolute magnitude greater than 4.6. Uh, but basically, no dwarf planets allowed. So, uh, and then all my co-conspirators on the talk are given down below. They're all with the uh, New Horizons science team. Okay, so what are some of the properties that we can use for comparing um, th these bodies and looking for similarities and differences? I've divided them into three categories, origin and evolution, physical properties, and surface composition. There are obviously a lot of different ways that you can compare and contrast objects. Um, in this very short talk, I'll only hit the ones in green. I'll talk about, uh, for the origin and evolution, something that turns out to be, very, to be key in the case of the, the Pluto small satellites is their formation in a, in a satellite formation disk. Uh, uh, but also I'll address uh, the question of, you know, the different dynamical families within the Kuiper belt. I'll hit a little, say a little bit about size of shapes and surface ages, but I'll spend most of the time on surface composition as reflected in albedos, colors, and spectra. Okay, so just a little bit of background on the Kuiper belt. Allen showed the cartoon of the Kuiper belt, which is roughly this torus-shaped region surrounding the sun just outside of Neptune's orbit. Uh, you see the position of Neptune here at about 30 AU. The classical Kuiper belt is basically between 30 and 50 AU. And is, but when you look carefully at the dynamical um, el orbital elements of, of the Kuiper belt objects, so what I've plotted here on the x-axis is the uh, semi-major axis for their orbits versus their, the inclination angle of the orbits. Um, and in the Kuiper belt, you have what we call the cold classical objects in blue here, which have inclination angles of less than five degrees. Um, the high classicals are everything else. Um, but you also have uh, objects that are in resonance with Neptune. Neptune is the 1,000 pound gorilla in this system and is controlling, uh, is still in control of the uh, orbital properties of most of these objects. Um, and in fact, uh, the ones that are really, really highly controlled by, the, by, by Neptune are the ones that fall into these resonances. And the Plutinos, uh, 
of which Pluto is a member, is in a three to two resonance with Neptune. So every time Neptune goes around three times, the sun goes around the sun three times, Pluto goes around twice. And there's Pluto right there, and there's a whole bunch of objects that are in that same resonance. Uh, the, uh, uh, but then finally, we have the, the so-called scattered objects. These are in, in the pink or magenta here. Um, and those are really hot, you know, dynamically very hot. Uh, some of them get ejected from the Kuiper belt into the inner solar system and become centaurs. Centaurs are these transitional objects. They have dynamical lifetimes of only about 100,000 years or so uh, that are making their way into the inner solar system, some of you know, was eventually becoming the short period comets. And we, as you know, we've just had the Rosetta mission uh, the, that has been, had been in orbit around comet 67P Chiriumov-Gerasmenko for a couple of years. Um, and that's one of those objects we think originally came from this scattered disk population. Um, New Horizons has passed through the Pluto system. It looked at the Plutinos, and it's on its way into the, you know, deeper into the, to the, the most populated region of the Kuiper belt to look at MU69, which is this, oops, that blue object there. That's one of the cold classical objects, and they're in nearly circular orbits, very small inclination angles, and we think these may be the most primitive objects in the solar system, basically, because they've been you know, pretty much unstirred since the time of their formation, and New Horizons is going to make a close flyby of MU69 uh, on New Year's Day next year. Okay, so just to refresh your memory about the results from the Pluto flyby, um, the uh, Pluto is like a mini solar system, has a total of six objects. Uh, the the pluto sharon binary pair is a binary planet, basically. But we have four small satellites um, shown schematically up at the top here, Styx, Nick, Nix, Kerberos, and Hydra, as you move farther in from, from Pluto. Uh, they're all roughly in the same plane, orbital plane, uh, coincident with the equatorial plane of Pluto, which is also the plane that uh, Sharon uh, circulates around. And uh, this kind of screams out at you that the whole system was formed by a giant impact about 4.6 billion years ago. And Robin Knupp, in a very nice paper, uh, can basically explain the architecture of the Pluto system. Here you have, down in the, in the bottom here, you have the, the, the uh, two proto-Plutos and Sharons uh, colliding, a glancing collision with each, with each other. They're color-coded so that the red is hydrated silicates, but you, these are differentiated bodies, and then they have a, a light blue coating. This is the mantle, which is pure water ice, assumed to be pure water ice. And then a little while after the, the glancing collision, you see you have the two bodies separated from each other, but there's this ice-rich debris disk. Okay? So I think whenever you have a multi-object system like this, you may have something uh, you know, like what you have in the Pluto system. And um, these are the best images that we have of each of those bodies. Those, you know, all of the, the, uh, the small satellites were discovered, in fact, by the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, Nix and Hydra, the largest ones, uh, they're roughly 40 kilometers across. Uh, they were discovered in 2005. Um, and so we had a little bit more time to be plan observations of those, and we got some very nice observation of those. Uh, Kerberos wasn't discovered until 2011, and uh, sticks in 2012, so we didn't really have much, to have, have much time to plan observations of those, but we still were able to resolve them. Uh, now, one thing that you learn about, uh, if you look carefully at that Kerberos image, it looks like two objects that have sort of melted together. It seems to be a common formation mechanism uh, you know, among the small bodies. Uh, and here's just a comparison of Kerberos to uh, 67P. And it really does kind of scream out at you that uh, they're, they're bilobate, uh, you know, two bodies that kind of s slowly came together and formed one body. Uh, with Nix, that was the one the pa spacecraft passed closest to, and we get the most detailed information is the high phase angle observation where we can actually count craters and, and make a judgment about the, the surface age. And as Alan said earlier, the surface age of, of Nix is very, very long. Old, I mean, more than you know, probably four billion years, um, and uh, so anyway, that's that's uh, I better run along here. 
so the, some of the things we want to compare are albedos. And basically, the albedos of most of the small objects in the Kuiper belt are very low. Uh, the uh, hot classicals have about 11% albedo. The cold classicals more like 20%. Uh, MU69, by the way, is, is, looks like it's at the low end of the cold classicals, maybe more like 10%. Um, and, but Pluto's, there's, their albedos, they're incredibly reflective, uh, between 50 and 90% reflective, and so they're off the charts here. Um, uh, don't really have too much time to talk about this. We talked about, Kathy showed you a lot about the colors in the system, but the colors in, of Pluto and Hydra, of uh, Nixon Hydra are nearly uh, neutral. Uh, a little bit bluer than, uh, the, than, than solar color. That little dot right here is the sun's color. And uh, red is, is down below, and, and blue as you go up. Uh, now, this is a very complicated figure. Just focus on the right-hand side. Don't bother reading the, the left. But this curve shows you the uh, reflectivity gradient. So the, the uh, relative to solar, okay? So up here, the reddest objects, here's 30% per 100 nanometers. Uh, the Kuiper Belt objects are generally landing out here, but Nixon Hydra are way down here, okay? And that's because they're not anything like the, the surface colors of, of, uh, of most of the Kuiper Belt objects. Um, and then a whole bunch of other objects in the solar system fall along that curve. Uh, the redder the objects, the farther up and to the right they are. Um, just really quickly, uh, we have a lot of more information on Nixon Hydra than we do for the, most of the small bodies in the Kuiper Belt. We actually have spectra taken with the infrared spectral imager on uh, New Horizons. Uh, the spectra, these are the spectra of Nix at the top and Hydra at the bottom, are dominated by crystalline water ice. So that's the reason why they're so highly reflective is almost pure water ice surfaces. But they've been that way for four and a half billion years, and how could that be? Well, I think that even though they've been pummeled by small Kuiper Belt debris throughout the entire age of the solar system, those are probably, you know, what happens is you, you strike the surface, stuff flies off, but it's lost to the system, and you're just digging deeper down into, into the Kuiper Belt, into the Nixon Hydra, uh, but they're water ice all the way down is my, my, uh, my, my theory. <laughs> anyway, uh, not just mine. But the other important thing is this little feature here, which is an ammonia-bearing species. It's not ammonia itself. It's not ammonia hydrate. Uh, some kind of ammonia-bearing species. We don't know exactly what it is. But there's another example of that in the Kuiper belt, and that's in the Haumea family. Um, this is, uh, Haumea is that very rapidly rotating football-shaped object. And, um, you know, it, its satellite, one of its satellite also shows that same feature. Okay, just so in summary, um, <laughs> Pluto's small satellites are unlike most of the objects in the Kuiper belt, but the ones that, for, you know, have formed in multiple systems uh, can be very similar to Nixon Hydra, but MU69 is, is presumably very, very different. And so I have no idea what MU69 is going to look like. <laughs> Thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. Okay, I have to, have to ask you, Hal, why is Hydra spinning so fast? I think it got whacked by a collision, and, you know, it, 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 uh, you know that that's only had to happen once, and it takes a long time to relax, so. Yeah, very quick. I have to also ask you, you confused me a little bit with the formation. Are you suggesting that the system was formed by one impact that made all the, all the five moons, even the one that has two objects? Yeah. I mean, they formed in the disk that formed. I mean, it's like a little mini solar system, really. I mean, you had the, d the d debris and then accumulation occurring within that debris disk. Okay, we need to move on. Simon Porter is going to talk about constraints on the shapes and rotation states of distant New Horizon Kuiper Belt targets. All right, um, so Hal gave the introduction to the sort of Kuiper Belt-ish objects that we visited that obviously have a very unique origin and different. 
And um, now we're going to talk about some of the ordinary Kuiper Belt objects we've been looking at. And this is the start of a program of looking at as many objects as we can going through the, the Kuiper Belt. Um, so as Alan mentioned, we're now in the Kuiper Belt Extended Mission. And the centerpiece of the, of the mission is actually going to an ordinary cold classical Kuiper Belt object. And that's 2014 ME69. And I'm not going to talk about ME69 at all here. Um, the following talks will dig real deep into that. But on the way to ME69, and then after ME69, we're going to be looking at what the objects that we pass along the way. Uh, because ME69 is a cold classical object, it's in the kernel of the cold classical population, we're flying through the densest cloud of KBOs that we possibly can. Now, they're not actually that close, or at least the ones that we can see from the ground and therefore plan uh, targets for are not necessarily that close, but we'll get as close as, um, I think, 0 .8, uh, 0.08 AU from the, the very closest ones, and um, observing uh, 25 to 35 other objects. Um, and some of these are going to be objects we get within an AU of, and some of them are objects that uh, are much further away, but then we're looking uh, back towards the sun at them to see if they're forward scattering. Um, and the object, or the, the instrument that we're using for, uh, to look at all these objects is LORI. Um, and you just saw a whole bunch of LORI images for the previous talks. Um, and I'm going to show you LORI images from the, LORI's sort of lower resolution but high, sensitive, high sensitivity mode. Um, generally speaking, LORI can get, with the, the sequences we've been using in the past, LORI can get down to a little bit over uh, a magnitude of 20 in V. Um, we just, this fall, tested a new mode where we can do a longer exposure time, and it seems to work great. So we think we can actually push that down to 21 for future observations. Um, LORI's not a big telescope. It's uh, eight inches across. Uh, it's only slightly bigger than my backyard telescope, uh, but it's in a very unique place, and so we're able to get these uh, very unique observations. So the first object that we looked at past Pluto uh, was 1994 JR1, now known as R1, RL1, um, and this is a three to two resonant object like Pluto. So it's in a very Pluto-like orbit. It's uh, about an AU away from Pluto. Um, and so we were able to observe it and get a full light curve for it. We were able to determine that it has a very fast period, actually, for uh, this class of objects of about 5.7 hours. And we were able to get a phase curve for it. Um, so we're actually able to, to measure the properties of its surface in a way that you can't from the ground. So the, the orange and the green points there um, over to the left, th that's what you can get from the ground. The blue points, you have to have a spacecraft to do that. And so we've done that for one resonant object. And then going forward, we're going to be mainly looking at cold classical objects because we're flying through the cold classical belt. Um, and then after ME69, then we might be able to get more hot objects uh, just because that's what's out there. But um, what I'm going to be presenting today is um, three of the cold classical objects we saw and uh, two of the dwarf planets. Um, so in order, and you know, that's, that's a small telescope we use. That's the eight inch, here's the eight meter. Uh, um, so in order to actually target with a spacecraft, you need a really, really good orbit for the KBO. Because from the ground, you're always looking at it um, you know, with the sun at your back. And you don't care what the uncertainty is in the radial direction of the, the, um, the orbit. So uh, you, know, you can have this huge error bar and actually how far away a, a KBO is, and you still easily recover it from the ground. Well, that's not the case if you're flying next to the object. Uh, so you need a really good orbit to target these. Uh, and so we had this campaign with, um, you know, going back for years previously with, with uh, Magellan as well, um, and with Subaru, and especially with the Hyper Prime Cam on Subaru, which is right at the top there, the prime focus. Uh, and that's got a giant field of view, so we can, so we get all these 12 objects. Uh, in 2014, we got them with a single field, single point in the telescope, then they spread out a bit. So this year, 
we got them with two fields of view, but we got all of those objects uh, in at least two different years and were able to really nail down their orbits uh, and get the low phases, low solar phases. So with the sun on our back, and then we can then combine with the high phases we get for, uh, from uh, New Horizons. So this is uh, the first one and it gets better. Uh, you'll note that the first observation there at the top, that's V magnitude of 19.9. I said we can get down to about 20. Um, well, this is what happens when we're getting down to about 20. It's, it's kind of scary, but it's there and you actually get a fairly good, error, a fairly good uh, photometric uh, measurement off of that because we know exactly where it is from these um, uh, ground-based observations. Um, and then, you know, we're 0.3 AU closer in November and it, at slightly higher phase, but still it, it, it was a magnitude and a bit brighter and you get a much more solid detection out of it. Um, and we just took last week a third observation of this object and the data is coming down now, so I haven't even had a chance to look at it, but we'll have three points on, uh, three different uh, points on this, and so we'll be able to build up a photometric curve just like we did with JR1. And here's HJ103. We recovered this one in September. Um, uh, just barely, you see that red chunk there is um, where the edge of the field of view of Lori. So it, it was just within it, but we got it. Uh, and that one is significantly brighter than um, HD84, so we're able to get great photometry of it, um, you know, despite the fact that it's even further away. So this is a, a larger object, and then we're going to get a, a nice high phase observation of it, or we did get a high phase observation of it uh, last week, and that's again one of the ones that's just coming down now. And here's HE85, which was the best of the cold classicals that we got this fall. Uh, so we got two different light curve epochs of this one because we knew it was going to be bright. And, and sure enough, it was. Um, so, you know, you, you can see we're getting down to half an AU uh, for the observations that we got down in November. Um, and then we're, again, observed it last week at a distance of 0.3 AU. So this is the second closest KBO that we've taken a picture of, um, but I haven't looked at yet, um, <laughs> uh, other than Pluto. So this one's gonna be really nice. Um, and so if you take those observations, you can kind of watch, uh, especially in the, so the bottom GIF there, um, you can kind of see the brightness vary there. So if you actually took, do a PSF measurement for that and um, figure out, or, you know, put that on a time series, then you get the blue points here. And, you know, there's, there's still some possible outliers there. Um, all these observations have a lot of stars in the background, and we try and subtract out the stars that, that uh, most of the time works, but sometimes you'll get a star or a cosmic ray that just really, uh, you can't tell that it's not a cosmic ray. Um, so a few of those points might be outliers there, but it looks like a pretty, pretty good signal for a 19.5 hour period, which is a pretty typical KBO rotation period. Um, so the next step is to then combine this with the ground-based light curves that we have on this same object from Subaru um, and try and see if we can use that to actually constrain its shape. And uh, this, is, this is really a, a prototype uh, observation sequence because we're going to be doing this for a lot more objects. Um, and then the, the two other uh, really good recoveries we got, well, okay recoveries, um, Quayar, uh, we previously observed both Quayar and uh, 2002 MS4. These are two dwarf planets um, in July of 2016 and then we observed them again this fall. Um, and Quayar is, you know, I mean, it says something that 18 is blindingly bright, but it, 18 is really nice. We get a wonderful signal out of this. If you'd like to see a phase curve of Quayar, uh, run real quick to see Ann Verbisher's poster. She could be because she's got that. Um, and then we were also able to recover uh, 2002 MS4. And that one's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's only a little bit further away, but it's a smaller object. So it's about two magnitudes dimmer. <laughs> 
but we were able to get two points on it, and both Quayar and MS4 will observe again um, in a few years. So because they're so far away, we don't, there's not a lot of urgency of observing them, whereas for uh, the co classicals, the, you know, we need a we're zooming past them and we have to take the observations real quick. So these are the upcoming scheduled observations so far uh, for 2018 and 2019. And you see, you know, well, we just went into, you know, we did all this. You know, the spacecraft has two modes. It's got a spin uh, mode and a three axis stabilized. So we had to go into three axis stabilized to take the pictures and we did that. And we just went back or you know, they're just going now going back into spin stabilized and to downlink the data. Um, and so we'll be in spin stabilized um, until August next year and then we'll start taking observations because by that point, uh, spacecraft will wake, wake up and be in the middle of the dense part of the cold classical belt. So we'll um, start taking pictures right away and uh, continue taking pictures all the way into the ME69 flyby on New Year's. Um, and, and then we'll keep on taking pictures after that. Uh, two of the objects to note there are 2014 or uh, OS393 and 2014 PN70. Those are the two runner up objects. So those are the two other objects that if we'd burned more fuel, we could potentially have gotten to. Um, and it just so happens that OS 393, the, we'll get the very closest to it of any of these distant ones. And that very closest is 0.08 um, AU. And that is like two days after uh, the ME69 flyby. <laughs> so there's uh, so some tricky scheduling in there, but we'll, we'll do our best on that. Um, but then we'll, we'll do observations again of Quayar and MS4 uh, in there. And we expect to be able to add more targets to this list now that um, this deeper 30 second exposures works a lot better than we thought. And there's my summary. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> We're actually out of time, so unless there's a burning question, um, I'm gonna move on to the next talk, which is uh, Mark Bowie who will be talking about um, a, pre a preview of 2014 MU69 revealed by HST and ground-based stellar occultations. How about that? Well, greetings. I've had a busy year. I don't know about you, but it's been uh, quite a ride. So. I'm going to show you some results. Some, um, we, I wish it was final results, and then we'd know what we're talking about, but we may not know the answer to this until the actual flyby in uh, 35 weeks, or 55 weeks, right? OK, so let's jump right into this. And so I'm not doing this alone. <laughs> There's, this is a, still an incomplete list, and just to prevent anybody saying, hey, I'm not on it, it's not, alpha, it's not alphabetized, and it's impossible to figure out if your name's up there or not. So these are the three campaigns that we worked with. Um, June 3rd, July 10th, July 17th, the, the, the line that's uh, going across the disk there is a scale drawing of the size of the shadow that's passing, we predicted passing across the surface of the Earth. You can see we could observe from um, southern South America and South Africa on June 3rd, July 10. It's mostly ocean and uh, very green bits of South America, which we didn't go to. And then finally, extreme southern South America on July 17. So I'm not going to say too much about June 3rd right away. I'm not going to get any of the details there, but it was uh, we missed. We didn't see anything interesting there, but it has a, has a role to play in the story. So then very briefly, we had a, a very large contingent of uh, mobile equipment, probably the, one of the largest international um, efforts ever led for this sort of thing. 16-inch telescopes with uh, some new technology, CMOS camera, the most important part of that is it has a GPS built into it, so when we take a picture, we know exactly when that picture was taken. This is very important for occultations. 
Um, all battery powered and is t all in total we had to deal with five tons worth of equipment that we had to ship internationally, keep track of and keep clean and all that sort of stuff. And we could not have done this without help from our embassy and the locals as well. It was quite an effort. Um, and then on July 10, that was a singular experience in my life, getting to fly on board the Sofia Airborne Observatory. Um, we had a fast camera there, and in the case of having an airplane, we could actually put it where we needed to be and didn't have to worry about it being over land. And uh, Sophia, during the flight, this was a very challenging flight. So on the left, you see there's a kind of a schematic size of the object we were expecting to, and then you see the red line, which represents the trajectory of the airplane through that shadow and we said, hey, can you please put it in this little tiny circle that's only one kilometer across? They scratched their heads and they came back and they did it. That was an, an amazing experience to do that. Of course, we didn't know exactly where it was going to be and during the flight we didn't really notice anything. Within a couple of weeks we had poured over the data and the, the light curve you see on the right is basically our final result from that and you see there's one low data point here. That corresponds to a chord length of about one kilometer. Also notice on here that that dip does not appear at zero. It's been taking us a while to try to figure this out. First we had to worry about, well, is this real or is this just some weirdness in the data? But everybody that's processed the data comes up with something. But we've it's taken a while, and I think I've got an answer for this that I'll show you at the end here, but it's important to remember that it's very short, basically one, one and a half frames long at 20 hertz, and it's shifted from zero. So then the fun came in July 17. Now, when we went to July 17, we didn't really know that we had gotten anything from Sophia, so we're thinking, oh my gosh, we've done two of these so far, we've come up empty, I'm not going to miss it again. And it's in a pretty tough area to work with, um, lots of wind and other challenges there. Um, we had a much better prediction. And you see on the right is the picket fence that we laid out. That's the, every station that we put in the field. And we got it. So here is a model-free representation of the data. Each of these lines represents the cut across the system. And the yellow dots indicate when the star either disappeared or reappeared. The line segments in between the yellow dots is when the star is gone. And you see we see a varying um, duration of the occultation cord length. And this is absolutely in no way a simple spherical object that we're looking at. And so already we are looking and saying, what the heck is this object? Okay. Now... This is what we came up with, and you may have seen some press releases that we put out to try to explain this object here. Thanks to James Tuttle Keen for these wonderful sketches. And you, in the upper view, that's basically a, an assemblage of matter that kind of mimics the pattern that we see in the occultation data. So on the left, that's a binary object. If you look at it from the side, they're not touching. You could separate them out if you're looking in a different direction. In the middle is a contact binary. Um, James seems to like these um, thin-waisted contact binaries, sort of like what you might imagine uh, um, Cherry Muff, Gerasimenko, but I think I like them a little bit fatter, waisted contact binaries. But in any case, no matter which direction you look from, they're, they're attached. And then the third one is this, what we call potato, or your favorite adjective for an object that is definitely not a sphere and has lots of chunks taken out of it. So this is what we thought we had. Now, if you go back to the 17th, where do we think the object is? Based on all the astrometry and the orbit we have for the object, the red X says that's where the object should be. Why is it shifted? Now, remember, I told you July 10, it was also shifted. Why are they both shifted? If we t say, all right, this is it, our astrometry is no good, the orbit's good, and we just force it to be on the red X, we can do damage to the orbit, tweak it around, and make it kind of line up, but it's still not perfect. It still kind of bugs me a little bit. So I'm looking for an explanation other than that. Okay, so let me uh, summarize the data constraints for you. 
June 3rd, no detection, no coverage of the center line, but close by. Eight kilometer spacing in the grid, 0.5 second exposures, low signal to noise. July 10, we get this one short dip near the center line, but off by 80 kilometers. July 17, again, we're near this, the center line, but we're off by 40 kilometers, and it's a strange shaped object. Now, these offsets are entirely dictated by the Gaia mission data that we're using to do the astrometry. This is very important. We are working at a, a level of astrometric accuracy that's unprecedented. And who knows what uh, demons lay therein. So let me take you through a quick explanation of what, my, what I'm thinking is going on. So here's the first event. So I didn't plot each one of these lines as one of our ground stations. And I'm not showing all of them because they, they, they go off the top of the plot. But here's the X marks where the object is. It's kind of at a scale, but it's, this is not a perfect rendering of what's going on. But it's trying to help you understand what we're looking at. So June 3rd, we missed. OK. July 10, we had a core that kind of looks like this. We got a really short dip. But it's not in the right location. Here's our big successful event on July 17. And there's a, a missing data there, and that's where the object is. So you imagine, OK, that's an object. What if there's another object out there that Hello. Sophia hit? And these things are orbiting each other so they can move around. So these things are orbiting their mutual center of mass. We didn't see the secondary on July 17 because it was just outside of our net. We didn't see it on June 3rd, because if you swing it around and put it up there, it falls in between the cracks, or it's too short or too tiny of a signal to see with the low signal-to-noise data we had there. And it means that we wouldn't necessarily have seen the big object with Sophia, and we wouldn't have seen it with June 3rd. So this now actually explains all the data, but requires yet another object. Now this could still be a binary in the middle, but we, I think we prefer the uh, contact binary explanation here. So now this is kind of the new picture. I prefer the contact binary in the satellite, but uh, who knows? We'll, we'll get there with uh, New Horizons pretty soon and we'll find out for sure. So this is just another representation of what we're looking at. And as I said, I prefer the, the middle one. Quick advert, we've got another occultation opportunity coming up on August 4th of next year. If we get some help from Hubble, and from NASA and lots of people from both uh, South America, mostly in Colombia, and also in Africa. We might be able to pull this off again and see both objects in one event. That would be really cool. But no matter what, we're going to be there and fly right by and see what kind of a crazy mystery object that we've got ourselves into with New Horizons. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Yeah, there are other occultation opportunities this coming year. Can you say more about them? Just, we have one possibility, and that's August 4th of 2018. So it's going to be kind of close to when we're getting into the hot and heavy stuff with the encounter, but we have that one, one try. It's going to be slightly fainter star than the July 17 star, but it's pretty close. Um, so our equipment will work. Unfortunately, the track is not going on a particularly great spot. It crosses northern South America, goes right across Colombia, then Venezuela. And um, Colombia is okay. Weather's not great, but uh, it's kind of okay. And then it goes into Africa, into some really scary places. And I don't know what we're going to quite do there. But So how well do you know the rotation, the or orbital period, whatever? Well, all we have is just sort of uh, guidelines. If, if we can, it, it's consistent with the data and things we know about Kuiper Belt objects that it could be like a two to four week orbital period. My little cartoon. Exp oh, you um, don't know what it is. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No. No. Very quick question at the back, and we have to move on. Why do you prefer contact binary? The odds of seeing it are much higher for a contact binary. We've been doing a, a 
Bayesian analysis of the observations that we've got, and uh, everything wants to do the, um, the uh, contact binary is, is strongly favored um, in this particular case. We're still working the details on that, but that's, that's the reason why I like the contact binary. Okay, we have to move on to the last talk of the session, which will be given by Jeff Moore. Great expectations, the new horizons, imaging and composition, pre-encounter plans and contemplations of <laughs> MU69. Yes, and just like uh, Mark, uh, there are many, many more people involved in putting this together than you simply see on that list. So let's dive right in. Um, one of the disadvantages of being the last speaker is that everybody is given some of your talk. So uh, let's begin by once again discussing the cold classicals. Uh, they have, here's a, a plot of, of uh, distance from the sun uh, and semi major axis uh, or eccentricity. And you can see that. Um, that uh, MU69 sets right here in the middle of, this, uh, of these black dots, which typically have inclinations of less than five degrees, and they constitute the cold classical population. Uh, and MU69 is intermediate in size, as we've heard from comets and Pluto, and is, for instance, 100 times more massive than uh, CG was. So the prospect uh, that the cold classical population, which includes our target, uh, may represent a population that is more unaltered and primordial than anything yet seen is exciting. I think we all agree. And indeed, we have learned just how complex and dynamic the early solar system was. The cold classical population of the Kuiper Belt has emerged as a singular candidate for fundamentally unaltered uh, original planetesimal population. And so M69 in particular provides a unique opportunity to explore the disk processes and chemistry of the primordial nebula, solar nebula, and compositional measurements during the uh, New Horizons flyby are of paramount importance. Well, you just heard from Mark Buey uh, that our object is, is certainly going to be complex. At worst, it'll be, sh or, well, depending on how you think about it, it may at least be shaped like a peanut, and it could be even more stranger shaped than that. Um, here's an artist uh, concept that you just saw in Mark's talk. I didn't see Mark's talk before uh, I made these slides, obviously, so I'm, I uh, apologize for repeating myself. Here is a CG here, both for scale and uh, ironically also maybe for size. Um, so let's bear in mind, this is sort of the situation we may find, including this idea of a trinary uh, orbiting moonlet. Okay, so uh, uh, high resolution imaging of the shape and structure of MU69, which again, as I said, is smaller than Pluto, but bigger than typical comets, uh, may show signs of its accretion from much smaller bodies, um, and using methone here, a, a moon of Saturn that uh, uh, orbits in its rings as a represent, representative of that object, or alternatively, uh, may be a collisional fragment from a much larger body if KBOs are born big. And, and again, even here, Eros has a shape similar to, and is also about the same size as the peanut uh, illustration you saw in Mark's talk. Okay, uh, KBO uh, binary formation, or even ternary formation, uh, uh, from streaming instability, pebbles, and gravitational collapse. You can imagine if uh, nothing happens in that system for four and a half billion years after they come together, we might see an object or objects which are smooth and, and methony like or if they've had some subsequent collision of objects out there, and remember that the population of impactors is extremely low relative to other parts of the solar system, we might see evidence for pebbles or other primary accretion signatures, uh, such as layers, as, you, as we're seeing in CG. Uh, the size of MU69, uh, which again we'll carry notionally, is around 30 kilometers, uh, places it in a class of objects which could harbor uh, unusual uh, and possibly even active geological surface processes. Um, now, for instance, let's consider a Helene, yet another co-orbital object of, uh, that co-orbits with uh, Dione around Saturn, um, shows evidence for uh, material collecting on its surface and, and actually being transported across its surface where there's, there's deposition, transportation, and deposition uh, taking place on the surface. And again, uh, maybe if we don't see a, a methony like object, we might see an object which in its final stages of accretion had material collected on its surface and move across it, perhaps. So we're thinking about things like that uh, in anticipation of what we might actually see when we get there on uh, the, the 1st of January of uh, 
2019. And then alternatively, you could imagine it might have interesting features like here you see in Phobos, another object about the same size as our target, where it has all these uh, unusual systems of parallel grooves. Uh, in this particular case, people think that may be related to the impact of Schnickney, but it could also be due to outgassing or other processes, which we'll simply have to see what we see and, and ask ourselves what could be forming them if they're there uh, on MU69. Okay, our closest approach field of views so gives you an idea of kind of what we should expect. Um, here's the narrow angle LORE camera, which takes a 10, uh, 24 by 1024 uh, frame image uh, in grayscale. Uh, here is the size of our Invic color scanner, which takes four different colors, has a very wide field of view and a, a fo focal length is simply, or a field of view that's simply defined by how, how long you keep it on, basically. And here's LISA, which is our uh, 156 uh, uh, channel spectrometer, um, and I'll show you some ideas we have concerning those objects. Okay, so the best images we'll get of ME69 uh, are currently planning, have an effective resolution of probably between 42 and, and 78 meters per pixel, and this is actually a consequence of, oh, I see the slides keep on moving, you go from one version to the next of Photoshop, I mean of, a, of a PowerPoint, it's wonderful. Uh, so, um, so as, again, as a consequence of, of smear and signal to noise effects, uh, we, are gonna, we live with this effective resolution after deconvolution and, and image stacking. And here is an image, uh, this, in this case, a high-rise image of Phobos, again, similar diameter, uh, that shows uh, the kind of quality image we would expect at closest approach after we've done these various treatments to the images we will collect. Uh, and also, uh, one of the virtues of a flyby mission is you get a continuing change in phase angle. And the phase angle will, of course, inc uh, will uh, increase as you pa fly past the target. Uh, and of course, under a, um, the closest approach, you get these ideal lighting conditions to understand geological interpretation, but equally important, of course, to all you uh, photometrists out there in the audience, we'll also get disc resolve photometry <coughs> on this target. And in this particular example, we've used some of the objects which Don looked at to give an example of the apparent diameter uh, and phase we'll see from actual planned observations in the, uh, in the encounter sequence. We plan to use MVIC, our four color uh, 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 camera, to uh, make color images. Uh, we'll use these color images. In this particular case, this is a series standing as a surrogate to search for compositional heterogeneity across our target. We'll look for evidence of surface and interior color contrast, where we, by that we interpret that there is an impact crater and throws out some ejecta. We might see evidence for something going on that's not immediately on the surface. And we'll also try to identify a potential space weathering trends. We're also gonna use LISA, our 256 channel spectrometer, um, which operates between 1.25 and 2.5 microns. Um, to examine the surface. Uh, and our resolution with that system will be between one and four kilometers per pixel. And again, here I'm using uh, Phoebe from Cassini as a stand-in. When we're looking for compositional information corresponding to uh, potential color features that we'd have seen in the color images I just mentioned in the previous slide, we'll identify um, and outcrop various ices which we anticipate can A, we can see them and B, they might be stable uh, and anticipated on the surface of objects like ME69. And these volatiles would also be interesting because I said, as I said, they're stable. Uh, if we detect them and map them on the exposed on the surface, they will be especially, it will be especially instructive to compare with uh, Cassini VIM spectra of Phoebe, uh, thought to be a captured outer solar system planetesimal that could have formed near Saturn or could be an, uh, in the ancestral Kuiper Belt object, and thus similar or maybe dissimilar from the nebular environment which MU69 formed. We expect good uh, topographic information. Uh, here I'm using it as a surrogate, uh, the uh, uh, um, a portion of a map of Phobos. We anticipate that our topographic information will be on the order of a 100 meter scale, both vertically and horizontally. Uh, and, and again, it would produce a map that looks similar to this one you're seeing here of Phobos. And I'm, I apologize, I didn't pass out uh, red, blue glasses, but I threw this in just again as another way to think about the sort of, of quality of, of uh, stereo coverage we're gonna get to here. In this case, uh, we're looking at Panda has um, a radius or a size, again, similar to the things we'll be looking at uh, during our encounter. Okay, uh, well also, we also have an Alice UV instrument. Now this is a little, for truth in advertising, we're not gonna get disk resolve spectra from uh, the surface of uh, Alice, we'll get a pixel on it. And the main function that Alice will serve will be to look for um, 
uh, coma around EMU69, but we could also detect H2, I mean, say H2O frost on a surface if it's there. Uh, likewise, we're going to use our uh, radio experiment, uh, uh, and perhaps Lisa as well, to see if we can uh, derive a surface temperature. Okay, so uh, this is pretty much the same slide uh, Alan showed at the end of his talk. So we are anticipating uh, as our major goals to characterize the uh, global geology and morphology and rotational characteristics of our target, uh, map its surface composition, search for any satellites and rings, which we have a relatively high expectation of seeing at least the satellites. Uh, we will be able to see rings if they're there. We hope to characterize or constrain the composition and magnitude of any volatiles or dust in the area, and especially those which might be escaping or have escaped. We want to characterize the physical properties of the target, uh, determine its uh, crater size and frequency distribution. Of course, I think it'd be interesting if it has no craters at all. That might be one of the most interesting results we might get. Uh, and of course, constrain its bulk properties. So with that, I will take questions. Thank you. Got a minute and a half of questions. Question, anybody have any questions? I'll probably get more questions in a year, or a year and a half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent stuff. I, I'm, I can't think of anything. Question for you. Well, I, that's nice about these sorts of talks is that there's not much to say except go collect the data. Go collect the data. Go out and collect the well, data. Well, we, um, there are 15 posters downstairs. I urge you to go down and look at those posters. Lots of information uh, about this fabulous mission. and. Uh, I look forward to a year from now being even more excited about our uh, potential flyby or our uh, we upcoming do too. flyby. Yep. Thank you, everybody, Thank all you. the speakers and the attendees. Thank you, guys. Great. I think we're probably almost exactly on time. Yeah. No. Nope. Good work. Yep. Good.